Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us on day two of Deploy. I'm Jen Petralia, and my pronouns are she, her. I will be moderating the discussion with our wonderful panelists who will introduce themselves in just a minute. I've been working in the tech sector for the last 10 years and currently work at DigitalOcean on the social impact team, uh, DO Impact. My team was created about a year and a half ago. And our focus is to empower change makers through four key areas, our people, so you think volunteering, donations, our philanthropy, which we just announced yesterday, uh, some, some grants that we're giving out to nonprofits, our planet, so focused on our emissions, and of course, our product. Um, so in my role, I focus on the product area and help nonprofit and social enterprise organizations gain access to and successfully utilize digital ocean technology in order to support and drive their missions forward. So today we're going to discuss how to best think about our organizations and cloud infrastructure during such an uncertain time, especially when pivoting and scaling up or down might need to happen quickly. We're also going to cover how to reduce complexity and avoid technical debt and hit on biggest learnings from past successes and mistakes. And finally, we're going to touch upon being a mission driven organization and how driving impact relates to key technical decisions. We'll leave time at the end for Q&A, but feel free to pop in your questions into the chat throughout the session. I feel very honored to be moderating such an amazing panel of leaders who bring to the table more than 40 years of leadership and technical expertise. They've both worked across many different sectors and have a lot of wisdom to share. So let's start with some introductions and uh, we'll go in alphabetical order. So Kavita, can you, uh, can you kick it off? Absolutely, Jen. Thank you so much for inviting me today. It's a real thrill to be here. Um, as you said, my name is Kavita Kapoor, and I'm currently the Executive Director of the Federation of Humanitarian Technologists. Our mission is to bring together open source communities that help humanitarian aid projects. For example, we work with Arm Digital, who have a case management system, and they um, help orphanages across uh, the global south to um, help kids uh, who are coming off the street and coming into education. And it's it's a brilliant program to be part of. So it's, I'm a, delighted to be here today. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks, Jen. It's also super exciting to be here as well today. My name is Tracy Kronzak. My pronouns are they, them. And I am currently director of partnerships at a software company called Bonterra. We are actually a new business as of a year ago. We are four or five different entities that were brought together with the explicit purpose of creating a new platform for nonprofit technology engagement. And I've had about a 25 year career in nonprofit technology, threading in and out of the corporate world. So I frequently describe my career as saying, I started when I figured out how to fix the fax machine and progressed to building server racks, then into cloud computing, then owning my own business, then working for corporate entities. And now again, having gone back to advising uh, application and builders to the nonprofit sector, and now back in the corporate world again. So I've seen a lot of changes in this time frame, as you might imagine, and it's exciting to be able to talk about them. Yes, and I'm excited to I'm excited to talk about it. So thank you both for those introductions. And I'm just going to start by stating the obvious, uh, kind of what Tracy had mentioned, but it's been a crazy few years we've all experienced together. And while change might be the only constant between COVID, the economy, inflation, elections, uh, global supply chains, increasingly intense weather. I mean, really the war, uh, the list really goes on and on. Things have felt pretty uncertain over the last few years. And through all of this, DO users are trying to figure out how to best start and or build an organization, especially when it comes to tech stack decisions. Today, we need flexible solutions that allow us to pivot, scale up, or like I mentioned, even scale down very quickly. So first, I want to start high level with how organizations should view the current economic environment and then get into how to think about reducing complexity and increasing flexibility as it relates to the tech stack. So let's start with um, how should startups, SMBs, and nonprofit organizations prepare to navigate the current economic climate? Kavita, I'm going to pass it off to you to, to kick it off. 
Well, thanks, Jen. When it was saying that list, I thought, well, you haven't included Brexit, which is part of what I have to deal with here in the UK as well. That list becomes endless, I think, at the moment. And one thing it makes me think about is that I've worked in I've worked in a situ in places like the Global South, where some of these um, issues have, have been at the fore in those organisations. And so it is now an opportunity for us to turn to those organisations, whether they be in Africa or in 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 my case, I, I speak to a lot to businesses in India who are constantly grappling with say climate change or uh, things like you know floods in black bangladesh etc um i was talking to a group of leaders just yesterday about this at bosch and they were asking the same question from that corporate environment um and my view at the moment is you have to control the things that you can control um you know you, that you will have a budget i'm sure you will have a p l to deliver upon you will have people that you need to look after and you do have campaigns that you need to deliver. Those campaigns will be ever changing, ever, ever adapting, and you will need some kind of agile flexibility, some kind of framework to, to produce that. But then that is, there are those constants that you can focus on internally. And, and I think the real question, and I'd love to hear Tracy's view on this, is, is where's the risk? boundary whereas before the risk was all internal where you were innovating 20 years we've had of just innovating and taking risks is it is this the time in the to be actually saying actually the risk is all outside now and we need to be really stable within the organization thank you yeah, it's it's funny, Kavita. I was thinking about that as you were talking because something you just hit upon was my first immediate answer. And that is, if you had asked me this question 15 years ago, what I would have said is more than anything, what's important is having a well laid out strategic plan that, that gives you a path of execution for the next one to three years. And following that fastidiously is what you need to do. And I think the big change that we've seen, particularly in the tech world, has been constant acceleration. And because of that, by the time you're done building that strategic plan, it's going to be obsolete. So my immediate answer is have a prioritized framework through which you make your decisions and know which priorities are part of that decision-making matrix. Because if you can do that, that will guide your execution through both certain and uncertain times. I also completely agree with that there are a number of externalities that I think are only going to increase in magnitude and complexity over the next few years. And what I would say is what got us where we are today isn't going to get us where we need to be over the next decade. And if you look at when you're investing in technology in specific, we've almost gone full circle in the sense that 20 years ago, we were investing in just grabbing any tool that seemed to work. And then we shifted substantially towards, let's centralize all our data, let's centralize our perspective. And now the rapid proliferation, uh, rapid proliferation of technology has said, okay, we actually need to do two things, meet people where they're at and recognize that technology investments are deeply personal for your organization and for the constituency that it serves. So more than anything else, the other thing I would say is look at how your tech data and your tech stack integrates with itself and facilitates the proper reporting and analytics towards the prioritized outcomes that are in your decision-making framework. Yeah, and I'm just going to come back on that because um, I agree entirely with that last part, but I was just going to call out, you said 10 years, um, the planning that we're looking at internally is 20 years. We think it's a flux. It's quite, a, it's a lot longer than we're, we are all predicting or, or even the newspapers are talking about. I mean, Something I would say to the philanthropists in the audience is that the way that philanthropy has worked in the past has been, what are we going to accomplish this year? And I think the big shift, Kavita, related to that is, what do we need to accomplish over a 20 or a 40 or a 50 year horizon that represents a series of incremental investments and infrastructural capacity building? 
Absolutely. Yes. And so those are all incredibly brilliant remarks, right? And looking at where we've been, where we are now, and where we're going. And so I think before I, I really do want to dive into that. So how do we make decisions uh, that best set us up for success in those in those 20 years as so many things are shifting, right? And I think finding the right technology that fits in best for your team is right, that meets you at where you are today, uh, I think is is a really good advice, Tracy. Um, but one thing I, I did want to um, ask before we move on and, and focus on that is right now with with it being so uncertain and with headcounts, you know, being slashed left and right, we are seeing a lot of uh, news around the layoffs. What are you guys thinking about with which skill sets should should you keep in house versus outsource? Because I know that that is what a lot of small businesses are looking at. What do I really need to keep in house? What is critical versus what might uh, we want to be outsourcing? Um, and and this can be from a business or a or a technical perspective. But any any um, any advice on 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 that topic? I'm not sure if we if, if I should go first or Tracy. But, go ahead, um, Kavita. I definitely have some thoughts on it, but I want to hear what you have to say first. Very kind. I was going to say, actually, for me, those things haven't changed very much. It's sort of it remains uh, focused on, you know, the folks that are mission driven within the organization, but also those people who have the capacity to learn, adapt and change and want to grow with the organization. Because that pivoting change, especially at the Federation, when we started, we started the month after lockdown in 2020. Um, what, what our uh, business plans looked like when we submitted it to the bank was incredibly different to what we ended up doing in the first three or four months. And the team that we came that came with us were all able to, week to week to be able to shift and grow with the organization. So I think that hasn't changed uh, sort of with this sh shifting landscape for me, but I'm sure Tracy. Uh, I mean, Kavita, the joy of doing this with you is that there's much overlap in our opinions. And I think the way that I was going to frame what you were about, what you said is, Right now, if you're scaling down staff capacity more than anything else, what I would say is keep your generalists, keep the people who are willing to cover multiple areas of expertise and have multiple arenas in which they can operate, even if in each of those arenas you don't have perfect depth. Because my opinion about what will be happening is those generalists are going to be the ones that are going to help shape the direction of your overall organization or business. And you can always hire on specialization or hire for very targeted needs that is not necessarily full staff, but could be contractors or other businesses to meet those specialized needs. Yeah, and we see this in corporates too. We can actually look at. Uh, so I used to work for the London Olympics, and what we do, what they do with the Olympic Games, Paralympic Games, is lift and shift the operation every four years, and that's exactly what they do. They have generalists who then manage a whole group of suppliers, and and they can lift and shift into each territory that they're moving into. So what we've seen with with big tech companies to date is that they they're basically standing up a whole corporation within each. Um, region that they're going into. I think that uh, those days that, that are changing and we will be looking at the very different model. Yep. Well, thank you both for those insightful comments and, and recommendations. So now I want to, like I mentioned, I want to dig into making smart decisions around your tech stack, especially when it comes to reducing complexity. And I think like Tracy said, like personalizing it to your business and to your organization. So as I speak to organizations across multiple sectors, one thing I continue to hear is challenges with technical debt. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on what is a sustainable way to approach scale, especially from an IT perspective. So Tracy, can you kick it off? Sure. Thanks, Jen. I think there, my opinions on this are very much informed by my experience in this world, which has been substantially in the impact economy arena, which that's a term I created. The impact economy is the global organizations and systems that serve 
mission-driven worlds and the economy that supports them, right? So when you're looking at scale in that arena, you have to understand that there are a few things that are true. One is you're going to be working with very inconsistent skill sets regarding comfort and expertise with technology. So meeting people where they're at, I would posit, is more important than actually getting the perfect tech for every circumstance, because it's those people who are going to be bought into your organization's mission that are going to have to execute on it. I think another key sort of learning that I've had over the years has been investing in technology is not a solution for investing in understanding yourself and your own business processes. And what I mean by that is many organizations and businesses too, for that matter, will look to a particular platform or a particular solution or a particular application to solve this problem of, we don't know how to do this, but if we just buy this thing, it will teach us how to do this. And those kinds of decisions will work probably for about three to nine months until the original purpose or until the original rationale or until the original mission behind that investment changes. And then suddenly what you've done is locked your organization to a way of behaving that may not actually scale to where your customers or constituents need to go. So those would be the two things that I would offer from, you know, having seen a lot of these things in the past. Absolutely. I'm quite intrigued by the term technical debt, actually, because, you know, I, I don't quite know where it came from and, and when it came into being. But I think back to the dot com era where we were building things. We used to build things. You know, I was at the BBC. We put 80 million into uh, building the very first website there. And then we threw it away and started again. To, and, you, and they threw it away and they started again and again. And that was basically how that whole period was um, built, right? You'd build something, throw it, build it again. Uh, obviously, at some point, we decided that we needed to keep updating and innovating and extending our feature set. And we've ended up in this very complex architectural world. We've got huge, uh, you know, amount of tech that's basically talking to each other. And if you take one piece out, you don't know what the consequences are going to be. So I think that journey is worth understanding because that's kind of where we've got to today and and rationalizing it and being able to explain it is really, really important, I think. I'm actually working with Ushihidi at the moment. They have a, um, a quite large stack of um, software that does mapping technology um, in order to support activists across the world. Really interesting. Look them up. They're amazing. But their project at the moment is to, rat to ratify their technical debt. And the way that we are approaching this is at the moment is that we're pulling together a community of folks who, exactly as Tracy was saying, have the, the skill set to be able to understand specialized parts of their infrastructure and engage with it. I think the other point I want to make is that I th over that sort of 20 year history where we're making things and throwing it away, or um, as we are now building and then ratifying our, our technical debt, I think partnerships are incredibly important. You know, So knowing who you're partnering with and making sure that they are continually, they continue to invest in their platforms or in their technologies, but they're willing to listen to you. So they're willing to say, actually, you need that feature set. We, we will prioritize it. Even if it's not commercially viable for all of our customers, you are important to us. And it doesn't matter for me if I'm working in, in the not-for-profit sector or in the commercial sector, that it's always really important. Something else, Kavita, if you don't mind, if I could build on that for one moment is, you know, there are two other things that I think about a lot when it comes to success and failure at scale. One is, I've said this before in many different forums, but the, the mantra of move fast and break things is dead. And it's dead because when you're moving so fast, as it turns out, you break everything. And that's actually a longitudinal contributor to technical debt because it leads to that circumstance that Kavita just described. And that is we have all these things, but we don't know why they're here or how we got them. And I think what's really important there too is the other thing that I think a lot about is what external what externalities are you creating? 
through your investments in technology. And that also bolts into partnerships because we're entering an era where increasingly more so than any other time in the history of this universe, technology can be enabling a lot of externalities. So when you as a business invest in it, you have to start thinking about what are the externalities of this investment? What is the sort of rubric of values that this technology aligns to according to what we're trying to accomplish with our own business? What does their partner ecosystem look like? How do they engage in this world? And then if you layer on even more so the climate crisis, what is this company doing that is making this world very good or very bad? Or what are you wanting to live with in your investments. And I think that is a values-driven perspective that didn't always exist because of that mantra of move fast and break things. That doesn't leave room for values. Technology investments now, because of the power and proliferation of them, are actually becoming values-driven. And yep. if they're not, oh, sorry, Jen, if they're not values driven, they're going to be um, governance driven because that's what we're seeing here in Europe, right? So it's the legislation will force you into uh, managing that more tightly, especially when it comes to data. Yes, yes, very good point, Kavita. Um, and so we actually have a, a question from the audience that I think plugs in really well with this topic. So I wanted to bring this up and it is around collaboration at scale. So, um, and I know we, we kind of started with, Hey, we built, and then to iterate, you pretty much threw it away and you rebuilt. And now we're at a point where yes, you're iterating, but creating, uh, this massive infrastructure that you don't even know if you take one piece out, like, is it, is it like Jenga? It's all going to fall down. Um, you're not sure. So, and I do think that now with the amount of collaboration tools that we have that are coming out that have, uh, really helped, I think, companies scale faster, uh, get get messages across a, a lot a lot quicker as well. Uh, where or how do each of you see potential for improved collaboration at scale across the sector by leveraging tech and cloud infrastructure specifically? So, I thought this was a really good question, just in line with what we're talking about. Tracy, any thoughts? Oh, tons. Um, <laughs> I think, um, you know, I'm going to draw from my background in impact worlds and, and say, I think that collaboration is not a top down thing. And what I mean by that is for a long time, foundations and even business collaborations have worked under the idea that if we just create a memorandum of understanding, or if we just create a strategic partnership, that will force collaboration and, and we will all be better for it. And, and as it turns out, collaboration is a grassroots feature. So where that top-down approach doesn't leave room for is understanding the genuine issues that folks need to solve in their day-to-day -day operations. So I think part of the steps to creating that collaboration is creating the proper listening mechanisms to either your customers or your constituency that will allow you to know the topics that are most relevant to them. And I, I guarantee it will not be the ones that you assume it would be. And why that's important is because I see a lot of collaboration software out there Certainly folks like Teams, you know, via Microsoft, certainly folks like Slack. So when you couple the ability to truly listen to your constituency and create pathways for their engagement deep inside your organization, however that looks, be it customer advisory boards, be it constituents on your board, be it partnerships with strategic organizations, what that helps facilitate is a grassroots approach to collaboration. And as someone who was decades ago trained as a community organizer, it really does go back to some of the premises of like Saul Alinsky's book. And that is you work with the people who show up, you meet the community where it's at, and you derive your priorities from the bottom up. You don't assume that because you have power and privilege and money and the ability to shape an industry, 
that your priorities are going to be those that your constituents or your customers are actually going to care about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have nothing to add. So I'll give you a case study of how that works for us, which is that we actually use a Mattermost instance on, on top of DigitalOcean where we invite all of our stakeholders. We do not you know, sort them out and say, you happen to be our funders, you happen to be our um, stakeholders, you happen to be the open source community that we're working with, or you happen to be a student um, in one of the universities that's uh, contributing to the open source stack. We basically have this platform open to everyone and we will shoot out questions, uh, we will work collaborative, we will run hackathons on it, um, and we um, we will take those ideas, just as Tracy was saying, we will take those ideas, contributions um, from whoever shows up, and I'm always amazed and grateful for how many people are invested in what we're doing and will show up. Yes, I absolutely love that, um, and I, I do agree, we've also seen a shift uh, with with who is able to contribute, right? Because um, I think, as Tracy mentioned, it it shouldn't be top top down. I think it it was uh, maybe ten, even twenty years ago. But now, with um, you know, uh, you look at from both a, a business uh, or an organization, but also the public has uh, more platforms to voice their opinions and to be heard. And um, it, it's been an interesting shift to just see in both uh our our private and public lives but also from from a organization and business perspective as well uh what happens when you can hear more people and uh what they have to say and their experiences um and so i did want to uh kind of talk a little bit about successes and failures you guys have experienced because we can learn so much from these right and so um and i think tracy you've really mentioned this right it's it's getting technology um, that works with where you're at today. It works with the people that you've hired. It it works, right? It doesn't necessarily uh, mean which specific technology it is, but that it it just works with the culture, I think, of, of the organization. And so, um, and I think this comes back to capacity. Where are you guys at? What is your capacity? Um, is is really important in understanding for technology success and being able to scale. So can you guys share any capacity and or scale related lessons learned um, that you've had in the past? And maybe uh, Kavita, we, we can start with you. Yeah, absolutely. So prior to working to the Olympics, uh, which was now a good decade ago, uh, the li my life was just, you know, uh, building software on top of a rack-based mounted machines. Those were my days. So I've gone that full hog. And the first cloud uh, computing solution that I worked with was actually at the London Olympics, where Microsoft said, hey, we've got this new platform called Azure, and we'd love for you to have a look at it. And that was absolutely brilliant. We used it. Uh, we we used a couple of um, different uh, solutions there. Um, we used Azure to um, to track the um, Olympic flame that was going around the world. So we did that. We did all the mapping software. The thing is that the Olympics scaled up to 8,000 people uh, with 70,000 um, volunteers at games time. And then they left me and 79 of my colleagues afterwards. And we kind of forgot how to uh, scale down. We knew how to scale down buildings, but no one had actually thought about how do you scale down platforms? And it took us a good six months to figure out, you know, we, we were burning th through uh, um, resources there or do we shift it to the next game etc cetera, etc cetera. so obviously that 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 was a real learning curve of how do you scale down um in a really record fast time because those eight thousand people uh left the building with overnight so really interesting um where we're at at the moment i you know is looking at how we can partner with folks so when we came we when we built the federation of humanitarian technologists we did go around and said who was be the right partner for us at that uh, at the scale that we're at at that point and again we were just coming into the pandemic as i was saying earlier who would pick up the telephone to us and say actually you need within two weeks um, to scale up a solution for the NHS, which is what we were doing very quickly, it was our first project. You need to get, you know, um, data samples from the hospital out to the central bank 
And literally we had 10 days turnaround to get that implemented and, and delivered. Who, who picked up the phone? Well, it happened to be digital. Ocean in this case, that we're very full, and they made it as painless as possible in, in that they just, you know, uh, got us up and running, gave us all the support we needed, and have continued to support us through that. Um, and, you know, whoever you decide to choose, they should be available to you to support you through that journey. Yes, I love that, Kavita. And, and certainly, I think you and Tracy have both hit upon this making sure that you are engaging with a partner, right? Not a vendor, but like a partner. Um, and so Tracy, any thoughts of uh, scale related successes or failures? <laughs> um, I, I want to pick up where Kavita left off. And, and when we were, you know, pre-gaming this before we went live, I kind of joked and said, I have failed so many times in technology. And you know, it was either because we didn't pick the right partner or it was because we couldn't scale up quickly, right? And what I love that you're kind of scratching at, Kavita, is that, you know, sort of age old adage of you can have something like done well, you can have it done cheaply, or you can have it done fast. And you always get to pick two of those, right? And that that adage has held like Moore's law for me in a lot of areas of my life. So I, I love that you have a real world example of how those things fit together. What I would say is true is that part of scaling is creating space for those failures and creating the proper retrospectives in your work. Because one of the repeatable patterns that I've identified in the impact economy is, you know, you go into an endeavor with a certain budget and a certain time frame and a certain goal, and it sort of gets framed as this can't fail. Because that's this is all we have. We only have this budget, this time frame, and this scale by which to meet it. So when it does, we don't actually go backwards and say, what in that rubric was wrong? We just say, it failed. We need to move on. And if you just move on without the proper retrospective, you're just going to repeat that investment again and again and again. And I think one of the things that's been incredibly frustrating in my own career has been watching the global impact economy go through these investments in technology tools only to wind up at the exact same place that they started. And that is where is the next fascination and how does that fit into our current ideas? And there's a lot of reasons why we don't talk about failure. We don't talk about failure because it's humiliating. It's it's uncomfortable. It's scary. A lot of us are like, well, my job might be on the line now. But in fact, building space and proper retrospective is a key to, to scaling. Because if you don't know what you did wrong and you only focus on what went well, you're getting false data. You're getting false information about where your business or organization needs to go next. Yeah, okay. and I'm going to build if it's okay, I'll build on that, which is I find that working, coming from the commercial space where you, really you can't afford to fail because, you know, your program, your project or whatever it will, will get shut down. In the not-for-profit world, that becomes really twofold and you get this option, you get to say, well, this is the impact I had, but I actually didn't stick to budget and this is what happened. Or I stuck to my budget, this was great. But actually, we did just didn't help as many people as we wanted to or, or could could have done had we, you know, flexed it. And I find that actually I'm having much more um, 360 conversations in this space about, uh, you know, people wanting to help. I'm always surprised when someone comes to me and says, actually, we gave you this, you know, amount of money and uh, you didn't you didn't reach, you know, the plat you didn't create the platform that you said you would do, but can we give you more so you can actually do it next time? And that I find really gratifying is that that conversation is changing because people are really coming around to, to how we need to invest into this space. Yeah, and one other cautionary tale that I would offer, particularly for those organizations that are defined as nonprofit or impact or mission-driven organizations is free doesn't always equate to appropriate. 
And there are more and more businesses in this world that are interested in supporting you and your organizations. And some of them will give you things for free. But that doesn't always mean that it is an appropriate investment for your organization, nor will it scale to where your organization wants to go. So it is also okay and safe to say no. Mm -hmm. And I think nonprofits sometimes operate in a scarcity mindset when it comes to these things, because it is so hard to get infrastructural investments from donors in the philanthropic world. So free isn't always easy. Free isn't always appropriate. And free doesn't scale, even if it creates abundance. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, we one of the things we find a lot is is we're because we're using open source stacks just to make sure that our um, the charities we work with, the not for profits we work with, aren't tied into those organisations that basically say, hey, hey, have five free licenses to this, and then as soon as you get into the sixth license, you realise you've got to pay for the first five, so you're in trouble now. So you never scale off your organisation. And so I know we have about nine minutes left and I do want to leave some time for Q&A. So I'm going to ask one last question uh, uh, to you guys, um, because one thing I absolutely love about this panel is how diverse both of your backgrounds are in terms of all of the sectors you've worked in, from small to enterprise, public sector to private sector, for-profit to nonprofit. And I think, as you know, Digital Ocean focuses on SMBs and particularly particularly because they are the builders, they are the problem solvers, and really the bedrock of the global economy. So I'd love to dig into the fact that you both work for SMB-sized mission-driven organizations and how this impacts the way you think about your IT strategy. And one reason in particular I want to I want to dig into this is because we are experiencing an interesting time where businesses are shifting from a shareholder to a stakeholder economy and really focusing on both their positive and negative impact on like really their broader community that they work in along with profit. Whereas I think 20 years or even maybe 10 years ago, the focus was only profit. So how does being a mission-driven organization influence any IT infrastructure decisions you make or your, your overall IT strategy? And so Tracy, um, what, yeah, let us know. <laughs> I, I want to do two things. I want to answer a question in the chat. Uh, and, you know, the chat is uh, around the retrospective on failures. And I think one of the things that counterweights hyper focus on failure is having a framework that is a prioritized framework for investment for your organization, because you'll be able to rapidly say, OK, we prioritize this. Here's where it met these priori priorities and here's where it didn't. And let's let it go. And let's move forward. Um, now, there's a lot of person transformation embedded in that. And there's a lot of fear. And it turns out that emotions are incredibly important decision makers when it comes to this world. But having something that can point backwards to and say, this was the framework under which we operated. Let's stop evaluating the failure and start evaluating the framework has been super helpful in my world. And then to sort of bring it to where Jen's wanting to point this now, what I would say is more than anything else right now for, for the impact economy, I find that who is at your table is going to drive how your technology is shaped. And what I mean by that is it can sound, and, and unfortunately in the United States, we have this very horrific narrative that was created for the current election cycle around woke organizations. But actually, the data that you can dig into clearly demonstrates that you will accelerate adoption, sales, and impact if you broaden who is at your table and making decisions about what is included in your technology from the get-go. And that can be as simple as things like let's stop thinking about gender as a binary and give folks a pick list to things as very complex as we were sort of talking about right before we went live. And that is, well, if this technology requires 
these other ancillary things like a huge sort of Java engine or, you know, hyper dependency on page loads and computers processing time and bandwidth for the constituent. Well, what does that mean for regions in this world where those things are scarce? So there is a wide gamut of things that will help you decide how to shape your technology by simply making more people available at that table who will give you those perspectives and say, actually, in my country, you know, we have one internet connection and that's not going to work. Or actually, for me personally, like my pronouns are they, them. Why are you just having a checkbox for M or F? Right. So it's really a gamut. But who is at your table now is more important than anything else when it comes, particularly if you're developing raw technology for the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think another way just to, to shape that and think about it slightly differently is, is to figure out, you know, take your mission that you have well crafted. It took us a while to craft us, so I know it's well crafted. And then understand your values. One of the things that my co-founder did was he brought the value of love into what we do. And it took me a while, I have to say, to scratch my head and say, hmm, how do you build loving platforms or uh, technology is that the feature is took me ages to figure this out until I hit on that idea exactly as Tracy is saying this is about the people who's around that table you know and what we do at the federation is we're a membership organization so we've moved away from being a charity or being um you know uh, not being a charity or not being a for-profit organization we're a membership organization where the members of the organization who operate it and influence it are the people who are those stakeholders who are benefiting from the organization. And that makes a huge difference as well. I absolutely love that. And also share that one of our values at DigitalOcean is love as well. Um, and it was, it, you know, there's a lot that that drove me to, to come to DigitalOcean, but that's certainly at the center of it. Um, and uh, we we hold those values very seriously. But I do uh, want to give you guys both a minute for um, any sort of call to action that you guys have before we get into Q&A. Um, and so, uh, Kavita, is there a way that we can support your organization? Uh, what is uh, something that we can do to help? Absolutely. So you can check us out at federationof.tech. And if what we do is interesting to you, then please just email me. It's kavita at federationof.tech. You can find me there. Um, and my takeaway is really um, to look at your personal ethics and see if it aligns with what you're doing. That's my takeaway. It's what I'm doing when I'm, I'm teaching or when I'm lecturing. Um, and it really, this is the time to explore it. I know that we're, I, I was very bleak at the top with 20 years of change and turmoil that I'm forecasting. But actually, we need people who are building tech for good right through that. And so this is a real opportunity for us to come together as a community. Absolutely. Yeah. Tracy? To me, I would say it boils down to two key things. What are the externalities you're creating and what are the values you're imbuing? And we haven't thought enough of those things. And when we do, we realize that even unbelievably prolific technologies such as like cryptocurrency has huge things like environmental impact and huge externalities. So this is the period of time where, you know, technology as a rapid in enabler is very accessible. So now it really is going to come down to what are you creating and what are the externalities in that creation and the values that you imbue in it. And one plug I will give is for N10's Equity Guide to Technology Development. Uh, we'll have it on the resource slide, but it is a thought framework around asking yourself, are the right people at the table for this technology? And it is an incredibly powerful tool that is written from a social justice lens. So do dig into that. It, it gives a lot of interesting questions and hard topics, a lot of airtime that I think will invest in the future for us. Okay, we're at time, but Tracy, 
Do you have a blog or a podcast that we can we can listen to you on? <laughs> we do have a podcast as well. My a dear friend of mine has a podcast with me called Why It Matters. It came out of a business endeavor that we were part of a couple of years ago. It is ongoing. It is us talking to each other and industry leaders. I would also say in addition to the Nonprofit Technology Network and the Equity Guide for Technology, if you want to look into how philanthropy is thinking about investing in technology, that is the Technology Association of Grantmakers. And lastly, when it comes to highly emergent and frankly, highly incredibly unstable, but very interesting technology, go dig into what Sheila Warren's doing at the Crypto Council for Innovation, because that field is a template for I think how we can start addressing real needs with values, but also putting a rubric for understanding it from a public policy perspective into place. Great. Well, thank you both so much for your time. This has been a wonderful conversation, one I really enjoyed. Um, I believe you can join us uh, at Discord after this. Um, I think we'll all be there for a few minutes. So please come bring your questions that maybe we didn't get around to um, and ask us there. But but thank you all and have a wonderful day or evening no, uh, where, wherever you are in the world. Um, so thank you. Thank you.